Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. In late December 1835, Seminole Indians ambushed a small U.S. Army command trekking along the old Fort King military road around present-day Bushnell, Florida. All but three soldiers perished in the attack. It has gone down in history as the Dade Massacre. It proved to be one of the Army's most lopsided defeats. How could an Army force be caught so unaware is a question military professionals still ask to this day. One way to answer that question is through the military staff ride. With us today to discuss the military staff ride and specifically how to conduct one at the Dade Battlefield is Mr. David A. Scotty Dawson, the command historian for the United States Central Command at MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa. Scotty, welcome to the Seminole Wars. Thanks for having me. Before we begin on staff rides, Please tell us what is U.S. Central Command and what do you do as its command historian? Sure. So uh, U.S. Central Command is a geographic combatant command. Uh, The United States military has divided the world up into a number of regions. Uh, We've got six geographic combatant commands, Indo-Pacific Command, European Command, Northern Command, which is the United States, Canada, Mexico, Southern Command, which is all of Latin America, South of Mexico, Africa Command, uh, and then Central Command, which is responsible for the Central Region, which is basically the Middle East. Um, So we have uh, pretty much from Pakistan to Egypt uh, in most of the Middle Eastern countries. And so we are, this headquarters is responsible for all military operations in that region. And that includes uh, the current conflicts in Afghanistan and the uh, current effort to defeat ISIS in Iraq and Syria. So uh, as to what I do as the command historian, is my main job is to keep a record of the activities that this command does uh, so that that record will be available to uh, uh, official researchers so that we can uh, write the official histories, official accounts of these conflicts, um, and, and use those to, to learn from. It's all about making the Defense Department a learning organization. And, uh, you know, examples of the kind of things we supported is the, the Army published a two-volume history of the Army in Iraq a few, couple of years back, and a lot of the research for that, uh, for those volumes, was done here at CENTCOM. Um, so we do a lot of supporting uh, the writers of official history and, and the official researchers who are going to work on those projects. But almost all the records we have are classified, so I always get uh, queries, you know, can I come look at your stuff? And, and the answer is if you have a clearance and you're an official researcher, by all means. But uh, we, we are not able to support unofficial research. So what's a military staff, right? And why would CENTCOM personnel benefit from taking one? Well, so the staff ride is a classic military instructional technique. Um, It goes back to the beginning of true professional military education. Uh, So like so many other things, its roots go pretty much back to the Prussians. Um, But it is a taking a group of uh, military personnel, usually officers, uh, to a piece of ground where a battle was actually fought and discussing the nature of the battle how the terrain affected the battle, the decisions that were made by the commanders. And uh, they were sort of a military busman's holiday, if you will, in that there was a chance to go out and visit these sites, but it was also a professional learning opportunity in in many cases. Um, And uh, uh, and so they've become quite commonly practiced in militaries around the world, and they're used as a standard instructional Technique and they're they're everywhere from you know from every level from entry level personnel all the way up to the most senior officers. Uh, the chairman, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, will occasionally conduct staff rides 
for the four stars that are on the on the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Proper staff ride would involve having the participants do a considerable amount of research and study beforehand and then visit the terrain and the participants would actually drive the discussion. They may be uh, assigned to lead discussion about a certain uh, portion of the battle or aspect of the battle or they may be assigned to play the role of one of the commanders. We once did a staff ride with my unit to Gettysburg where everyone was assigned roles of uh, specific commanders and we tried to make those align with uh, their actual assignments. So the battalion commander was Meade, um, the, the executive officer was Robert E. Lee, uh, the fire support, uh, the weapons company commander who's responsible for fire, fire support was assigned to be the commander of Union Artillery. Um, the scout sniper platoon commander was assigned to be the commander of Breton Sharpshooters and talk about the employment of sharpshooters on the battlefield, that kind of thing. Well, this may be a two-part question, but who supplies the materials and distinguish between a military staff ride and a military battle tour? Well, so that's that's a good question. Um, in terms of who provides the materials, you know, a, a unit can conduct a staff ride without a lot of outside support, um, and that, but it then becomes a uh, responsibility of some member of the unit to go do some research, find the reading, um, and help the officers. And then to some extent, the officers can be told, go do your own research. So again, with the Gettysburg staff ride, is uh, we assign one uh, overall book for everybody to read, and then it was up to each officer when they were given their assignment of who they represented to go do additional research on that particular individual and be able to discuss that person's actions on the battlefield. Often a staff ride, there will be a, a professional historian or a staff ride team. The U.S. Army actually has uh, people who, that's their job is to help lead and conduct staff rides, uh, and they can provide the readings. And there's been a lot of research that has been done for more prominent battlefields where you can either get issued or purchase guides to the battlefield that become your guide to the staff ride. So uh, with Dade's battle, um, we're lucky that Captain Michael Anderson, when he was an ROTC instructor at UCF, put in the legwork to develop a staff ride for the Dade battle, and that was published by the Combat Studies Institute uh, as an excellent guide to doing that battle. Um, when we talk about a battlefield tour, and this isn't a, you know, this isn't a technical definition, this is just kind of a term of art. Um, but uh, a battlefield tour is a professional visit to the site, but doesn't require anywhere near as much preparation work for the participants and doesn't require um, the participants to be as involved in the presentations. So usually the participants will do some background reading um, and then a, uh, a, a tour guide, either somebody from the battlefield or park ranger or a historian um, will lead the group, will talk about what happened at the battle at various locations, and then we'll ask questions of the group and ask the group to start considering things, but we'll lead the discussion throughout. Um, with a staff ride, it's much more participant driven, much more, they play a much more active role, and they're expected to have done a lot more research. Uh, one of the challenges that we get within the Defense Department is that um, because battlefield visits are such a large part of the educational process and almost all officers at their entry level, entry level education in the Army and the Marine Corps will go do a battlefield visit and it's always referred to as a staff ride. It's almost always in fact actually a, a battlefield tour and throughout their careers officers will go visit battlefields, they will be told they're going on a staff ride, but what they're really doing is, a tr is really a battlefield tour. And you see that all the way up through, through War College. Are uh, enlisted folks able to go on either a military staff ride or a military battle tour? So enlisted personnel, absolutely. And, and per personnel of any rank can um, benefit from a battlefield visit. Um, and so when we talk about battlefield tour versus staff ride, 
a uh, big part of it becomes what's appropriate for the level of um, rank education and experience for the audience. So entry level enlisted personnel, you may absolutely want to take them to a battlefield, but it's going to be much more of an instru instructional mode where they will be in receive mode um, and they'll learn about the battle. You cannot assume that they're going to have any significant amount of background knowledge about the battle, even a battle as prominent as, say, Gettysburg. For senior enlisted personnel, you can expect them to have much more background knowledge um, and you can expect them to be able to do a lot more research. And there's no reason why senior enlisted personnel can't have a staff ride that's just as involved as, as one that you would do for officers. Um, but with an enlisted staff ride, you would expect the focus to be more tactical, more about the, the lower level tactical decisions maybe getting up into the operational level of war. And one of the big challenges when you organize a staff ride is to uh, make sure your focus is at the appropriate level for the audience. So for junior officers, senior enlisted personnel, you're probably going to focus on the tactical level. For mid-grade officers, you're going to focus more on the operational level. And then for senior officers or officers who are assigned to a senior headquarters like CENTCOM, uh, you want to try to focus on more strategic aspects of how the battle played out and how the battle infected, affected broader strategic issues. Um, so it's about tailoring it to the amount of time the audience has to be able to invest in preparing for the staff ride, what the training objectives are for the staff ride, and then what, uh, you know, what's the nature of the audience, um, what can you realistically, you know, what's the appropriate level to pitch at 19 year old high school graduates just entering the service are going to be a very different audience from a bunch of lieutenant colonels and colonels on a senior level staff. Uh, because this is such a widely used tool, um, most of the coalition officers are very familiar with the idea of a staff ride and they're conducted on a very similar basis. So with um, taking the British contingent here at CENTCOM, to, to date battlefield, and we did more of a battlefield tour than a staff ride, but very much the, the same kinds of expectations for, for the visit, and, and um, they do their staff rides almost exactly the same way that the U.S. military does. The date battle marked the opening shots of what we call the Second Seminole War. Why do you choose to take the CENTCOM military people to the Dade battlefield for a staff ride? What makes it especially compelling as a battle for you to study? Well, so that's a great question. Uh, the, the, the real answer is why CENTCOM we go to the day battle is because it's convenient. So one of the aspects of the staff ride is logistics. Um, how easy is it to get to the battlefield? Um, how much time are you gonna try to spend on the battlefield? Uh, and um, uh, you know, to what extent is your effort worth it? So uh, day battlefield, has a great advantage of its less than a two hour drive from Tampa. And it's the only major battle that occurred within any kind of a reasonable driving distance of Tampa. Uh, there just weren't that many true battles held in Florida. Uh, and the Second Seminole War is the only real major conflict that we see in Florida. Uh, there's obviously a lot of conflict with, the, with uh, our native peoples under the Spanish rule but we don't really see much in the way of pitch battles. Um, we have, you know, some Civil War activity in Florida, but it doesn't, Florida's not a major theater of operations for the Civil War. So unlike Northern Virginia, where you can't walk more than five yards without tripping over a battle site, um, there's just not that much here. Uh, so the main reason we hit day battlefield was it was some place we could get to, drive to, do it in a single day, without having to invest a huge amount of time, effort, money, um, or, or get a lot of logistical support. Uh, and when we first started doing the day battlefield, I thought to myself that eh, this is probably not going to be that great because how much can we learn from a column of men just walking into an ambush? Uh, but as we started actually preparing for and conducting the staff rides at day battle, we realized that there's actually a lot going on in the Second Seminole War. So while it's one of America's more obscure conflicts, there are a lot of really interesting lessons 
that are extremely applicable to the uh, the conflicts that we have seen in just the most recent couple of years in the CENTCOM AOR. Well, in the case of Dade Battle, where do you begin the actual staff ride? And so this gets into you know how the logistics of a staff ride work. And one of the you know uh, in a perfect world, your staff ride would follow the chronology of the battle. But the chronology of the battle doesn't always match your layout of the terrain, and you also want to avoid doing a lot of backtracking back and forth. So um, with with Dave's battle, ideally, what we would want to do is go start at, at Fort Brook, um, then go up to the Dave battlefield, and then probably go down to Fort Foster. Um, because at Fort Foster at Hillsborough River State Park is where we want to focus on the events that start occurring after the day battle. But because of the practicalities of doing a staff ride, we just completely skip Fort Brook. Uh, Fort Brook was the, the main base, and it was the first major settlement in Tampa. Uh, what was the location of what was Fort Brook is now pretty much the parking garage for the hockey rink. There have been a bunch of dredge spoil islands that have been created. So when you go to where Fort Brook was, not only does it not look anything like the terrain did at the time, but you're basically just standing uh, on a walkway against the, next to a bunch of modern buildings. So uh, I don't see any value in going to the Fort Brook site because it doesn't give you any feel for the terrain, doesn't give you any feel for what it was like at the time. And, and the only significant action that occurred there, that's where they left from. Um, and then we actually start at uh, Fort Foster, Hillsborough River State Park. Um, that is on the line of march that Dave and his men took. They followed what was then known as the Military Road, uh, closely follows route, US Route 301, 301, runs pretty close to the old military road route, and they cross the Hillsborough River right where Fort Foster is now located. So when you're there, you're on the path that Davis men took, and so we can talk about the issue of crossing the stream, the issues that the cannon gave them in getting it across the ford. Um, there's one man who's badly injured and is sent back to Fort Brook at that point. Um, but we also... Uh, talk about the post-war period because we're at Fort Foster. So it's a it's it's about an hour drive from McDill Air Force Base. Um, it's a uh, it's a good convenient first stop. Um, and uh, and it is on the route, but we end up talking about aspects of the campaign out of chronological order. We actually end up spending more time at Fort Foster than we do at the actual day battlefield. We haven't ever done this but one of our plans is if we wanted to do just a half a day staff ride is we would just go out to Fort Foster for half a day, spend a couple hours at Fort Foster, and that could be a very short staff ride. Um, and this gets into, you know, when you're talking about a staff ride, you know, Gettysburg is an example where you can do Gettysburg one day or you could spend almost three days doing staff rides at Gettysburg um, for, you know, day battle probably not going to do three days, but you want to spend just a couple hours, you want to spend a whole day. Fort Foster wasn't there when Dade went by, it was built later. Uh, Fort itself, as a recreation, is pretty accurate. So what what makes it so compelling then uh, for staff ride people to uh, go to Fort Foster? What does it offer? Well, so, staff, so Fort Foster offers a couple of important things. You know, so first of all, it's, it's on the route of March, and so you can have a discussion, you can actually visit the Ford Point, talk about the challenge of fording and Dade's decision to bring the cannon with him. Dade insisted on bringing a cannon, was suggested that he might want to leave it behind. Um, he, he was adamant that he needed to take it. So he has about 100 men and a cannon, and I presume he had some kind of a wagon. Um, but uh, the men could basically carry what they needed on their backs, and they could ford the river easily. So getting the cannon across this obstacle becomes a, a significant problem and challenge and it slows them down quite a bit. So what was the point of their trek through Indian country? Why were they moving along this path? Yeah, um, so Dade Superior uh, was located at a place called Fort King, which is in what's now Alcala. 
uh, Florida, and he was uh, uh, amassing the troops in Florida, um, getting them all together at Fort King so that they, he was preparing for conflict with the Seminoles because he knew that the Seminoles were about to be given an ultimatum, uh, which was going to tell them, pack up and go to Oklahoma or else, and expected resistance. So he wanted to get all of his forces together and have a large enough force to compel the Seminoles. So he sent messages down to Fort Brooke that said, send reinforcements up. So Dayton and his men are marching north uh, to reinforce the army at Fort King. Um, now, Day had delayed his departure because the commander at Fort King had delayed the departure of the force because he was expecting reinforcements to come up from, I think, Fort Jefferson, but further down in Florida. You know, he needed to keep some kind of a garrison at Fort Brook, so he was hoping to have a large enough force that it would be reasonably safe, reasonably secure, because it would be so big the Seminoles couldn't overwhelm it. Uh, he was aware that if he sent a small party of soldiers um, that they risked being ambushed and annihilated. And he's under pressure, so he finally decides to send the 100 men that Dade volunteers to lead, and Dade uh, becomes the senior officer on this force of about 100 men, which ends up being the worst of both worlds. It's not, uh, as we see, it's not big enough to be really secure against getting wiped out by the Seminole, but it's big enough that it's a really impressive body of troops to wipe out. You know, had this been 20 men massacred or wiped out, it wouldn't have been anywhere near a psychological shock. Um, so uh, if it had been 200 or 250 men, the Seminoles probably wouldn't have been able to amass enough force to wipe them out. Um, they'd probably have been able to flick some significant casualties, and then they would have had to retreat uh, because they would have risked being overwhelmed by the size of the force. Scotty, how much of a misnomer is it to call it the Dade Massacre as opposed to the Dade Battle? Or is it just hyperbole? So I'm falling into the old terminology because I'm an old guy. We used to refer to it as the Dade Massacre, and it was called the Dade Massacre for quite a while because, of course, there's only one, um, there's only a couple of survivors of the battle, um, one of whom is um, so highly suspected of potentially of being in cahoots with the Seminoles. Um, so, uh, but massacre implies in a lot of people's minds that there was something somehow underhanded or nefarious about this, which is, of course, not the case. It's the Seminoles ambush Dade's force, um, and then uh, after the initial uh, skirmish, which lasts for a while, you know, at least an hour or so, it kills probably half, maybe slightly more than half of the force, the Seminoles withdraw. But then Captain Gardner uh, organizes the survivors, um, builds a small redoubt to uh, defend themselves. They fell some trees and make a little little small uh, breastwork um, to, to defend themselves. And the Seminoles at that point feel that since they're setting them to defend their, their, themselves in Seminole territory, they go back and re-engage, and the force continues to fight back until they're almost completely wiped out. So it wasn't like they were, they were, you know, the Seminoles in some underhanded way, you know, massacred them in their beds. It was a, it was a battle. It was just an extremely one-sided battle. And so these days we refer to it as Dave's battle, not the Dave massacre. You have said to me at other occasions that uh, Fort Foster looks more realistic terrain-wise and, and from what, things are in Fort Foster than the actual Dade battlefield where the actual battle was held. Please uh, discuss that. Yeah, sure. Um, that's absolutely true. So one of the reasons I like to start with Fort Foster for the Dade battlefield is that they've done a great job of preserving a chunk of the old military road. So there's a couple hundred yards of old military road that is right on the route of the road and it's preserved extremely well. Um, and so you can um, walk that as you approach Fort Foster. And when it's open for visitors, usually what they'll do is drop visitors off at a point about 150 yards and have you walk up and the guides will talk about, you're now in Seminole territory, you know, watch out for, for, for Indians gonna shoot you and whatnot. But the terrain there looks very much like the terrain would have looked at Dade's battle. 
So it's a great place to give staff ride participants an idea of what the terrain would have looked like. And so what you have is saw palmetto, which comes up to about three, maybe four feet tall, probably about three and a half feet tall. Um, so if you're standing, you can see across the saw palmetto, and then it's very, very thinly scattered pine trees. So you have excellent visibility out to quite a distance. Um, and Dave, who was on horseback, uh, while he was marching um, through what's now Bushnell, uh, had uh, pulled in his flankers because he assumed that they would be able to see any Seminoles quite a ways off. Um, but the salt palmetto is quite thick, and it turns out that the, the Seminole were more than capable of concealing themselves in the salt palmetto, which, which again, when you walk in Fort Foster, you can see, oh, yeah, you can hide in that quite easily. This was a big mistake on Dave's part. Um, so you can understand how they were able to be ambushed, while, how they could get a false sense of security while getting ambushed. On the, on the approach marks, there are areas where the woods were much thicker, and in those areas, Dave did put out flankers, um, but he had pulled them in by the time he got up to what is now Bushnell. The other big advantage of doing Fort Foster is, you're right, they've done an excellent job of recreating the Seminole Arrow Fort, so at Fort Foster is where we talk about how the war is conducted after the day battle. Um, the day battle is the event that actually starts the war. They and his men know that war is in the, in, in the offing. They recognize that there's an excellent chance they may get attacked while they're marching up to Fort King, but the war hasn't actually started yet. When he marched by the Hillsborough River, there was no fort there at the time. It's built there afterwards to protect that crossing and to protect the bridge that's put over the Hillsborough River. But the forts then end up starting to get built all around central Florida, and they're used as, as what we would now call Ford operating bases, or a FOB. Um, and the forts are actually more logistical supply points than they are garrisons for troops. So there's a lot of food and ammunition and other supplies that are stored in the forts, and they're built uh, thickly enough on the ground so that you're never more than a day's march or so from a fort, and that allows the uh, U.S. Army troops, both the regulars and the militia, to go out and operate in the woods, chasing down Seminoles, burning their crops, driving them out of any villages they might have, and then they can always get to a fort, one, if they get into trouble, but more importantly is they, they can get to a fort quickly and easily, resupply food, resupply ammunition, get whatever they need, and go right back out again. So they're effectively able to campaign without interruption and without having to worry about where their supplies are going to be or having to go back to a seaport or to Fort Brook or Fort King, which, which would take them out of the, the area of operations for an extended period of time. So Fort Foster offers a great opportunity to talk about how the forts were used and how the uh, American military was able to conduct what was actually a pretty effective counterinsurgency campaign. And it takes years and it takes a lot of troops and a lot of effort, but they're able to can compel the vast majority of the Seminole to come in, surrender, and accept relocation to Oklahoma. And there's only a small handful, maybe a couple hundred at the most, probably smaller than slightly smaller than that, that eventually retreat all the way into the Everglades. Uh, and at that point, it's determined that it's not worth trying to winkle them out. And you know, the Secretary of War declares the war is over. And, and for all intents and purposes, it was. In contrast, for the realism that you get at Fort Foster, even though it's a recreation, we have the Dade battlefield where the battle actually happened, but it seems somehow less authentic. Right. And so, so Fort Foster is a reconstruction, but it's, it is on the site where the fort actually was. It's almost exactly on the site. It's done extremely well, so it gives you a great feel for what it would, must have been like day battlefield. It doesn't look anything like it did at the time of the battle. Now, we're extremely fortunate that the battlefield was preserved at all, and that it didn't just get turned into a parking lot or a Walmart or something because um, this happened to a lot of battlefields. But the day battle was significant enough that fairly soon after the battle occurred, people uh, in Bushnell decided they would preserve 
where it occurred. This was a significant event. They wanted it to be memorialized. Um, and memorials were put up on the battlefield um, not too long after it occurred. This was preserved. And people in those days weren't thinking in terms of preserving the battlefield. They were thinking in terms of memorializing it. So what got preserved was just the immediate area where Dade and his men were killed. Um, the area where the Seminole fought from wasn't really preserved at all. And then over the years, a lot of changes were made to the terrain. There was a pond that was behind Dade's force, which limited their ability to maneuver. That pond subsequently been trained. Um, and the park limits stop right where Dade's men wore, and there's been no preservation off the park. So you get no feel for what the terrain was like uh, surrounding his position. You know, there's a parking lot that's not far for the battle actually occurred, so where the Seminole were positioned is pretty much what's now a parking lot of occurred. You've got the route of the military road, you've got the route that Dade's troops follow, you've got markers and monuments where uh, the officers fell in the initial ambush, and they built a um, small recreation where they felled some logs, you know, uh, show where Captain Gardner had, had men build those small breastworks, but you really have no feel for what the terrain was like, what it looked like, where the Seminole were operating, what the soldiers were facing when you visit the Dade Battlefield. But it's not all static, because at both Fort Foster and at the Dade Battlefield, you sometimes encounter living history interpreters. How do they differ from battle reenactors, and what value do they bring to the staff ride? And that's, that's a great point, and the reenactors are a tremendous, or the, and the living history interpreters are a tremendous asset, and they add a lot to it. So, um, I mean, the Dade Battlefield is, it's not all, you know, it's not, it's worth visiting, and there's, there's, there's still a lot of things that we can discuss, and we do discuss with the staff ride when we visit the Dade Battlefield about decisions that are made, particularly Captain Gardner's decisions, after the initial ambush. When we talk about the, the reenactors and the living historians, it's not like there's a sharp division. Most reenactors are, are doing some level of living history, um, but a reenactor is somebody who's more focused just on going out, dressing up, participating in, in battle reenactments, participating in the camps that they hold. And a living history person is someone who is more focused on educating a public audience. Often it's aimed at kids, school children, but any public audience, you know, most adults don't know much about this either. So they, they dress the part and they go into character and they talk about what life was like during the period that they're representing. And, uh, you know, great example is if you ever visit Plymouth Plantation in Massachusetts, and it's always, I believe it's 1627. So you go into Plymouth Plantation, it's whatever day of the year it is, uh, you know, so it was May 5th. When you visit it, it's May 5th, 1627. Everybody is portraying an actual historical character from Plymouth Plantation, and they won't come out of character. You know, so they'll talk to you about life in the plantation. For the Seminole War, you see the same thing. They'll reenactor who's portraying a regular soldier, Reenactors playing somebody in the Florida militia, reenactors portraying Seminole, reenacting who's playing a, a, a Seminole woman, and they will talk about you know what who they are. They'll have a character. They'll talk tell you anything you want to know about what life was like for that character, how that character saw the conflict, how that character thought about things, and it's a great great educational tool and it really makes it concrete. So it's really a great way to engage a public audience. One way I see as a distinction is the living history interpreter is interactive with visitors, whereas the battle reenactor is out there. It's more of passive for the audience. They watch a battle recreation unfold, but they're not actually talking to uh, one of the um, reenacting soldiers and said, hey, what are you thinking as you're going out there? That's, I think that's very true, but what you see is a large portion of the reenactors um, see themselves as historical interpreters and have a commitment to engaging the pu public. So there's some broad overlap in the population. So you do see people who uh, basically their, their main focus is a living history and interpretation. And you see a lot of people who they mainly just want to go and do the battlefield reenactment 
and they're not that interested in engaging with the public. But I would say that probably most of the people who are involved in these activities see educating the public as an important part of their hobby, their pastime, their activity. And a lot of them have done a tremendous amount of research, and so they, they have not only are a tremendous educational tool to bring this history alive, particularly for younger people, you know, it takes something that seems dry and dull and makes it um, vibrant, alive, immediate, and exciting. But uh, a lot of them have done research that's helped them form a lot of academic understanding of uh, Civil War, Civil War, you know, what are the practicalities of life like? So there are a lot of academic historians who will turn down their, their noses a bit at the reenactor community, but uh, there are others who recognize that there is a really valuable, mutually beneficial relationship that academic historians can have with a reenactor community. One of the things that uh, impressed me in going to a reenactment and watching the Seminoles is the first shot, and as we saw with Dade, the first shot took out 50% approximately of his right. command. Um, but subsequent, I mean, they had time, so they actually uh, got the rounds in and the powder and everything else um, because they were, they were ready for it. But on subsequent firings, they didn't pack it down as, uh, as tightly as on the first one. And so uh, one wonders, well, how did the battle go on so long? Well, some of the rounds, as the historic accounts say, you know, they, they would bounce off the soldiers uh, because they hadn't been packed in. And when I went to a reenactment, I saw the Seminole reenactors had rounds in their mouth and, and they, uh, they had to reload quickly. But uh, that was a demonstration to me of, of why um, the battles often took a long time uh, because the rounds weren't as effective on the second and subsequent firings. Well, right, and this is, I mean, this is a well-known um, aspect of 18th and early 19th century warfare. If you study the Napoleonic Wars at all, um, or, or you know, Marlboro, you know, you're well aware of the fact that the first volley is always the most effective because it was loaded where the, the uh, tr soldiers had time to do it properly and they were not under a high level of stress. Uh, once the first volley goes, you're now reloading with people shooting at you. Uh, it tends to distract you somewhat. And so the Seminole, once they get that first volley off, it's extremely effective, but now they're reloading while they're trying to move. They're trying to make sure they're staying low so they don't present a good target. The surviving uh, Army troops are shooting back at them um, because, uh, again, after that initial volley, the survivors immediately break into what we might call skirmish order, but they, uh, or what they probably would refer to as Indian fighting order, but they, uh, you know, they start hiding behind trees, they start high taking cover, looking for, looking for ways to hide themselves, and then they're looking for in, to see if they can spot Seminole warriors and try to shoot at them. So, you know, you're not having volleys just blazing away. Um, you're having people loading, looking for targets, shooting, and it, and it does go on for quite a while. Uh, this is my chance to give a brief promotion for the Dade Battlefield, because while you take staff ride participants out there, you don't get a battle recreation. But uh, every January, the first weekend after New Year's, on Saturday and Sunday, they actually have a battle re reenactment that goes on, and you can see the things that you're talking about uh, right there for, for the general public to learn more. Well, in Fort Foster, we'll do periodic encampments, which will be open to the public for a small fee, uh, and they will have um, the reenactors will come out, they'll set out their tents, they're all set out living in tents that are the kind that would have been used at the period. Um, a lot of time their wives are there, and they're dressed in period costume as well. Um, often uh, people will have some, you know, uh, stalls where you can buy things if you're interested in that kind of thing, but they'll put on a reenactment, and it's a living history encampment, and it's a, you know, it's a fun thing to visit, and it's also a great educational opportunity. You know, absolutely, uh, those are the best ways to go and experience this, and if you've got younger kids, you know, elementary school, middle school age, a wonderful opportunity because the kids really enjoy it and it's a great way to get them introduced in history in a, in a way that's really accessible to them um, and to help get it spark that interest in learning about the past. I think a lot of professional historians 
got their start as a kid visiting a battlefield or visiting a living history encampment. You've taken a number of groups out over the years. How captivating have you found the participants being from uh, going to date battlefield, both in looking at the battle and the battlefield, and uh, seeing what they say about the value of it for their professional military education? So every trip I've taken, I've always gotten extremely positive feedback. With the British and doing the battlefield tour, they knew nothing about the Second Seminole War. They'd never even heard about the Seminoles. You know, why would they? Not their history. So they found it extremely valuable. They had no idea that Florida had been um, home to such a significant conflict. And, you know, I also did one time a true staff ride with the planners from our plan section. So these were all field grade officers, very well educated, all, all um, graduates of top military staff schools and some of the smartest and best educated officers the U.S. military has. And we did a great staff ride and the, uh, the one-star general uh, who had a doctorate in history and uh, he was adamant that he wanted to do a staff ride, you know, came up afterwards and talked about how pleased he was with it because, again, he was skeptical that, uh, you know, it looks like a bunch of guys walked into an ambush. But we did, a, you know, we were able to talk about the bigger picture of the Seminole War, the use of the forts, the use of the fobs, um, how do you deal with a, a uh, indigenous insurgent population that is, is highly mobile and won't stand and fight. And we were able to draw comparisons particularly to the campaign in Afghan Afghanistan against the Taliban. And so it was, it was a really, you know, very worthwhile and effective staff ride. So, uh, you know, um, Dave Battle is actually a, a good example of the fact that even your less significant, um, smaller actions can be worthwhile exercise to go visit and do a staff ride. Uh, you know, it's easy to see the value of going to Normandy to do D-Day or going to Gettysburg, um, but something like Day Battlefield can also be highly educational, and then it can be tailored to a variety of different levels. So it's it, you know it's worthwhile to take NCOs out. It's worthwhile to take um, aspiring junior officers, ROTC cadets, out. But you can also get a really valuable uh, day out doing the battlefield with some of your most senior and educated officers as well. What pitfalls can you get into? Uh, or trouble, one might say, from misapplying purported lessons from the date battle? Well, I mean, you can misapply purported lessons from almost anything. So, I mean, one of the, you know, one of the first ones with the date battle, of course, is, you know, gee, put out flankers. And this is an ancient lesson, but it never ceases to astound students of history how often it gets uh, ignored. And, you know, it's a reminder that some of these battlefield basics are often neglected because they're hard. And anybody who's been a junior officer or an NCO knows how hard it is, particularly when you're tired and you're hungry and it's raining out, to do these basics like put out your your flankers for security, um, you know, dig in uh, when you stop, um, you know, do all of these kind of basics. It can also highlight some things that we take for granted at the tactical level that maybe or we should rethink. Because one of the things I was taught as a junior infantry officer was everything revolves around supporting your crew serve weapons. Well, Dave brings a crew serve weapon with him, a cannon, and during the battle, the cannon turns out to be not just useless, turns out to be actually uh, detrimental. Um, Captain Gardner insists on having soldiers man the cannon. The Seminole doesn't get hit by a cannonball or a canister ball out of the cannon at all. I don't believe even a single Seminole is even wounded by the cannon. Uh, they're able to pick off the men who are manning the cannon, and Captain Gardner keeps ordering more men, and, and the vast majority of the men who were killed after the initial ambush are killed while they're working the cannon. Uh, to no effect whatsoever. So uh, Dave was adamant about bringing the cannon, and all it did was slow him down. Uh, and then, and then again, not only not useful, it was actually actively counterproductive when he actually got engaged with the Seminole. So there are a lot of things going on there. It's more than to it than just meets the eye. There's the issue of um, building the redoubt, the breastworks there, which the Seminole regarded as provocative. So the Seminole, after the initial skirmish, 
felt that they inflicted sufficient damage and they pull off and then when they start building the breastworks they feel that okay this is insulting they're going to stay on the land we got to go back and re-engage and that's when they kill uh, almost everybody at the, the breastworks that doesn't guarantee that had captain gardner said we're going to go ahead and keep marching to fort king that some other group of Seminole would not have come out and ambushed the survivors but Captain Gardner's decision to not leave the wounded behind is another great learning point because the modern U.S. military has made a uh, cult of leave no man behind. And we've never been in a situation where there were really significant costs to following through on that. So we may have paused on it, waited till nightfall or waited a day before we recovered the bodies, but we've always gone and, and gone to great lengths to recover the bodies, but here's Captain Gardner who is faced with a real choice, which is either see if you can get the survivors to Fort King or stay with your wounded, but you really can't do both, um, and there's no way that the dead, dead can be taken with him uh, at all. Now, the Seminole just leave the dead on the battlefield, and so uh, a while later, a uh, column comes up and finds the bodies which is how we know where the officers fell, where Dade fell, and the others, because they were, they were still laying where they fell. Scotty, on that cherry note, we're at our show's end. Thanks so much for lending your expertise to us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep the show going. Visit our website at www.seminolewars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Seminole Wars Podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted. The Seminole Wars Foundation 2021. All rights reserved. Front bumper music The Devil's Garden. Roast em, Provided by kind permission of Reedy Onman. Back bumper music Second Seminole Win by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman. Courtesy of Ricky Pittman. All rights reserved.